Good day. It's Tuesday, April the 20th. I'm Martin Gago with Radius Research. Today we're joined by Dan Blondell, CEO of Nano One Materials and an O on the TSX Venture. Nano One announced today that it has successfully completed phase one and two of its joint development agreement with a previously announced Asian cathode producer, and that the joint development will continue to progress. Dan's here to provide some insight on today's news release. Dan, thanks for joining us today. Great to be here, Martin. Thanks. Uh, can you just give us, a, like we, we've read the news release, can you just give us kind of over, a bit of insight, overall context of, uh, you, you announced this um, initial cathode, Asian cathode producer back last July. And what did phase one and two kind of consist of, I guess? Yeah, look, look, we've been working with these guys for about a year. That's the relationship started about a year ago. It took six months to put the JDA together, the joint development agreement together. And that those those uh, between August and now, we've been uh, we've been developing, uh, uh, you know, it was, uh, LNMO cathode materials to their specifications, testing them inside in our lab to work comfortable with them, sending them over to them, having them evaluate them, and then making it larger volume, sending it back to them and testing in their battery test team. And so all the, all really uh, many of the, sort of the the performance and technical hurdles we have overcome in the, uh, since the August timeframe. And then we've also done uh, some preliminary uh, look into the, the techno economic analysis of the material. So is it going to be, can we make it in a cost-effective way and, and can it be done using you know, conventional equipment, et cetera, the CapEx is relatively low, the OpEx is relatively low. So all of those hurdles we've crossed now um, in phase one and two, and then that moves us into a phase where we will start to do third-party evaluation of the materials with some of their potential customers, um, de much more sort of de detailed economic modeling, which we've done already internally, but we're gonna start sharing that with them in, in a lot more detail. And ultimately, we'll be looking at scale up and and plans for commercialization. Uh, those are that's what comes in the in the next call it six months. And and so far, what you've done is just lab scale. It's like make small batches, send it to them. They're working in their lab, making sure if theoretic like it works here on a on a real life basis, but no sort of larger scale production. Yeah, I would say we're at the kind of kilogram scale um, at this point. So a little bit beyond lab, but uh, but not a not on any kind of large scale manufacturing, but really from from our from what we do here in our Burnaby facility, we will we'll kind of max out around the 10 kilogram scale for most kind of uh, most kind of testing um, because it, anything beyond that um, you start to have to think about uh, putting sort of larger scale pilots in place. Okay, so hopefully the net, you said six months, we should expect maybe some, hopefully some follow on news saying that this is sort of yeah. phase three or so has come to a, a yeah. conclusion and then hopefully it's moving on to phase four type of thing. Yeah, as, as I've said in, in, uh, in some of the uh, sort of in, in various kind of interviews over, over the last while, we would like to see some kind of sight lines on the commercialization of this of of, uh, of this material and, and others in 2021, uh, with the eye to uh, to piloting in 2022 and revenues by the by the end of that year. Uh, those are you know hopeful, wishful thinking. There's lots of uh, lots of ifs in there and lots of caveats, but uh, I think this this announcement today proves that we're 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 hitting our stride and we we are executing on our on our plans. And, and I think that becomes just a little bit more certain uh, with this news release. All right, and they're a cathode supplier. So they would supply a Panasonic and LG cam. And I'm not naming, I'm not trying to say specific companies, but they, the actual guys who build the batteries themselves, they're a, a component supplier or a material supplier to the battery guys, right? That's correct, yes. Okay. And um, this is with LNMO. Um, that's not a, that's a, uh, that doesn't have a lot of commercial adoption at this point, that uh, battery technology does. There isn't, no, there actually, there is no LNMO batteries out there uh, from, a, from a commercial standpoint. And that's because there's still challenges in making that battery. It's a high voltage battery and operating that high voltage regime requires advanced electrolytes and, and, and various things like that. We proved last year in, uh, um, in kind of in the August and kind of November timeframe that you can make a, uh, you can make a long lasting uh, LNMO battery uh, using our material uh, that lasts out to 500,000 cycles, even at, uh, at some, of, some of the automotive operating temperatures, 50 degrees C, etc. So we believe that um, uh, it can be done. We have some IP in that area, and our partners uh, believe the same, obviously, um, because we're willing to, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, 
co-develop and uh, co-develop that not only the material but the the, the market for it and uh, the idea is to go forward commercially with them to do that okay and that the lnmo the use cases for that kind of technology would be in the automotive space or what kind of segments would the uh would well, that it's a full, be full range of materials so lnmo as you can tell it's got no cobalt in it right so it's cobalt free it's actually low on nickel and, and dominantly manganese so the fact that it's got no cobalt it's low on nickel and actually it uses um uh there's no excess lithium in that battery so those three things make the cost relatively low uh, the fact that you don't have these kind of expensive components and you've got uh, manganese uh, which is relatively low cost as a dominant component so it makes it a very low cost material and then it um uh it, it performs on par um uh from a from a power and energy perspective with some of the high nickel materials particularly in when you're talking about high uh high charge and high discharge applications so high power applications and fast charging rates um, that's where it starts to really sort of perform quite well and on par with the nmc but of course the cost is, is quite a bit lower so where we see it's uh, it's dominant application is going to be where where uh, where you've got high power and and, uh, and and fast charging requirements. Of course, that's automotive, and but it could be any number of other sectors. It could be drones and power tools and 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 various other places. The fact that it runs at high voltage, a full volt higher than NMC, means you can reach design voltage maybe with fewer cells instead of having five cells. You could have four cells, and that simplifies the the battery pack and and drives down cost as well. What's been the, why hasn't LNMO been adopted to, what, what are the technical problems that has stopped it from being commercialized now? And, and I guess then what do, you, what do you solve in that problem to make it potentially commercial? So there's, there's two failure mechanisms that, that have um, limited the adoption of spinels. Now, spinels um, themselves, they, the idea of a, it's called a high voltage spinel or, a, or, a, or LNMO, uh, the two kind of interchangeable names. But spinels have been, have been uh, uh, commercialized. Lithium manganese oxide, which is what, was, uh, what powered the battery in a Nissan LEAF. Um, has obviously been around for quite a while, but it suffers from uh, problems with temperature. As the temperature goes up, manganese tends to dissolve in the electrolyte and it fouls up the inside of the battery. And um, so that's one of the driving mechanisms. And it's, it's the same is true for LNMO. It's got a dominant amount of manganese in it. The nickel drives the voltage up. And then what happens is as that voltage goes higher, um, you start to get side reactions in the battery and gases are produced um, inside the battery. And if it's, a, if it's in a pouch, it'll puff it out and it'll just stop working. And so the, you have to solve both of those problems, both of the manganese dissolution and the gassing problems. And we demonstrated a battery last year and filed patents on it uh, that does exactly that. And, and we're, not the, you know, we're not the only people who are going to solve that problem because it's, it's a matter of balancing the electrolytes and all that stuff. But I think we're, we're at a stage right now where you know, we're, we're showing one of the sort of uh, the up and coming solutions to do that. And other people will as well. And look, all of it's good for us because it means there'll be the adoption of LNMO, which we can make a very low cost version of. All right. And Volkswagen's made some noise about the LNMO uh, technology, right? Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful getting that alpha part of that alphabet out, isn't it? <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, yes. So at their power day, they talked about the three dominant materials they feel are going to are going to be uh, big players going forward. That's the uh, the high nickel NMCs for long range electric vehicles, LFP for industrial heavy duty applications where the battery is being cycled um, much more aggressively than than uh, your average. Uh, a sort of uh, light vehicle. And then LNMO, which they believe and we do as well, is going to play a, a major role in the future of lithium ion batteries simply because of its, uh, its cost per kilowatt hour at the end of the day is, is probably the most favorable of all the, all the battery materials. And, uh, but it's gonna, you know, it takes, it's gonna take an, uh, a level of integration at the cell level um, to make that, uh, to make it work. And that's something we're very actively involved in. So look, what Volkswagen talked about is completely independent of Nano One, but at the same time, it plays completely into our wheelhouse. LFP, NMC, and high voltage spinel, we've been saying for a long time that all three of those materials are strategically important for the battery world. They solve different problems, they address different needs, and they're all gonna be, uh, uh, critical uh, going forward and we've got a we've got a piece in each one of those games all right if the lnmo does roll out roughly as expected around what year could we actually see the like commercial adoption of the the technology what would be well, a 
assumption. Well, like look, I think I think it's possible, even if we're successful on the battery level, to start seeing LNMO in small commercial applications within a couple of years. Um, okay. uh, but it won't won't uh, you you won't build out a complete car battery out of it and, and see it in a, in a in a vehicle um, in, in that time frame. But you'll see it in, in in drones and power tools and various other places where the design cycle on those batteries is measured in months or a year. Um, as opposed to electric vehicle, which is the design cycle is five or seven years. Um, so there, you know, you you kind of have to start out in, in these uh, in these applications where they can adopt faster, and then as the cost and the manufacturing expertise gets better and better and better, then the adoption rate will happen at the vehicle side. And I guess on the vehicle side, they're more risk averse as opposed to a drone manufacturer. If a if a battery isn't, they, they find some technical problem with the battery a, a year or two out replacing a bunch of drones is less risky than if cars are catching on fire or some uh, issue like that, or there's some failure on, on a... Well, well, certainly from, from a brand point of view, yes, they're, they're extremely sensitive, but also from just from a capital deployment point of view, you know, they're going to be basing this, they're going to be, the, the auto manufacturers are building a platform, right, to stick between the wheels, the skateboard, basically, yeah. right? And they're, they're building this platform, they're going to have to invest in it, and they're going to have to invest in the supply chain. It's, 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 you know, billions and billions of dollars to invest in this, and they want to make sure that that it's got longevity, it's got legs, it's going to last, it's proven. So um, they're, they're risk adverse from that point of view as well, is that they're, uh, if they're going to bet on a platform, they want to be sure that it's, uh, that it's here for the long run. So it, it's partly just need to have that comfort level in place, and they need to have a ton of it de-risked. Um, just you know, just from an investment point of view, let alone the brand, uh, the brand sensitivity on 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 safety. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I, I think we've covered everything here. Is there anything else you want to add to this, or uh, should we wrap? No. It? Uh, great, great, uh, great set of questions. Uh, always a pleasure. All right. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks for the update, and we'll talk again soon. Have a great day. I appreciate it. Yeah, you too.